Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Melinda Smith, and I am the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Research for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the University of Calgary. It is my honor to welcome you to Courageous Conversations. The theme for the 2021-2022 Courageous Conversations Speaker Series is Decolonization and Questions of Justice in the Academy. Our second conversation features Dr. Sabello and Luhuvud Gatseni, Professor and Chair of Epistemology of the Global South at the University of Beirut in Germany, and Dr. Isabel Altamirano Jimenez, Professor and Canada Research Chair in Comparative Indigenous Feminist Studies at the University of Alberta. Courageous Conversation Speaker Series is designed to tackle difficult and challenging questions, questions that are necessary to combat systemic inequities injustices and necessary to pursue epistemic freedom and a decolonial futures. This series is one aspect of the anti-racism, equity and decolonization work taking place at the University of Calgary and within the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. I am speaking to you today from Calgary and would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siskaka, the Piguni, and the Gaini First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nations and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Beapaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Today, we will be thinking, we will be talk, thinking, we will be talking about the rethinking of coloniality of power, knowledge and being with two internationally renowned scholars and opening with Elder Colleen Sitting Eagle, who is the elder for our series. I would like to start this important conversation with a blessing. We are fortunate to have with us Elder Colleen Sitting Eagle. Elder Sitting Eagle is a language instructor at the Sisica Outreach School on Treaty 7 land. And she's one of the, the very important elders to our treaty community. She has worked as a researcher for the Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park and has been employed with the Siskaka culture and heritage community. She is a traditional knowledge and insights. She has traditional knowledge and insights on the ways of being and doing that are so important in our journey towards reconciliation. We are deeply honored to have her here today. Also, I should note, she's a proud mother of three and grandmother of eight. We know she is a very busy woman. And in fact, prior to this, she was engaged in a teaching course in a class on cooking. So please join me in welcoming Elder Sitting Eagle. Okay, get connects much in Okwa and Oxistic way. And Okidaka boards my cartum of Wagako Kitinak, Yokinak seaport. Hello, my name is Colleen Sitting Eagle. My six again name is Sipiana Tokumiaki. Um, I'm going to give a blessing in my language and I'll just uh, give a few opening remarks and then I'll get back to my cooking, but I'll keep you guys on here so I can come back um, once they're done. So, I was to do again, Oxistikuya, Moxinoka, Noko, Noko, Tutuka Sawakia, or Kikima, two subs to do again in on style, is Tokuma Kikte, connects to Kuskide Katsimatu, or we walk on what we eat a people, can cook in none. Um, she pours his stack of his stuff for his pomuts and an amoxy exipu to a moxiac sea pigs, or kick exig one of common bed pieces and an oak him out to some oxy nymphs takes. 
Kimmatukin and Abstituke and Oxistiqui, Ovido Kitista Besk, Namats and Namuxi Poo Cakes, Manis de Sipi, Makanis de Suxipate Pisa, Oginok and Poets and Wicamuxi Ice Cheeks, Amuxi Egypt Stopix, Amuxi Deskin Mats, Oki Kimmatukin and Abstituki, Spumukin and Nisami Pate Pis and Arsi Pate Pis and Oki Ketakit Konokuk Finan. So I've uh, blessed all of you and your families. Uh, we usually, as elders, we usually don't, uh, we're not very selfish. We always send our blessings to those that are listening, those that are at home waiting to greet us after the busy day we've had. Um, I just wanted to share just a little bit on the topic today, the power of um of people. We have suffered under decolonizing. Um, we went through many things, residential schools, illnesses, right? Uh, today, we are battling with a very sad event here in Siksika, and that's our addictions. Uh, within the last two weeks, I think we've had quote, a death every day, young people with um, different illnesses and addictions, but I ask you to send a blessing our way that, <coughs> excuse me, we can strengthen our lives and help these people. We talk about residential school. We've, we're battling it. We have come out as winners. Uh, <coughs> like I mentioned to another class I taught from U of C last Thursday, I showed them a PowerPoint of um, Sixaga history. And through residential schools, the power that we have as individuals, as Sixaga people, Sixaga Itzitapi, we have the power within us to fight any battle that's set in front of us. Like our warriors in the past, they didn't back down to anybody. So when, when, when I talk about that, I'm saying that a lot of people uh, went through abuse, went through many abuses. They were punished, they were tortured in these schools, so-called um, to teach them how to be better people. But on the long run, some have gone into a shell and won't speak of it. Some have become clergy. And I'm proud to say that the indigenous bishop for Canada is from Sixaga Nation and that's Bishop Sidney Black. So, <clears throat> With that, I just want to say that I work in a school where I promote the language, I, <clears throat> I preserve the culture, and um, with that, the many people in the world that are battling identical problems as us, we just need to stand together. Um, power to the people, as they say and um, send each other blessings. So if that's, um, that would be my opening comments to all of you. Like I said, I'm just on the other side of the door here. So I'll keep you guys on, on air. I'm just gonna go check on my fry bread and the students. Okay, thank you very much for letting me uh, give the blessing today. Thank you so much, Elder Sitting Eagle. So I want to begin the session by speaking about what inspired the two women who inspire the Courageous Conversation speaker series at University of Calgary. And the first is actually a Calgary born um, uh, Violet King. As some of you may know, she became the first black woman lawyer, not just in Alberta, but certainly in Canada. And Violet King, um, since she was in high school, said uh, you know she wanted to be um, a criminal lawyer. She wanted to be in the legal profession. And at that time, not many women were in the legal profession. In fact, there were only three women in her graduating class, which included people like Peter Lawhey, who became Premier of Alberta. But people asked her, why do you want to be a lawyer? It was not probably a good idea for a woman to be a lawyer, certainly not a Black woman. 
And what Violet King said at the time, which I think was not only courageous, but showed determination and also said, uh, uh, refused the limits that people placed on her, was that people told me it wasn't a good idea for a girl to be a lawyer, particularly a colored girl, a black woman. So I went ahead. And that is, that is she refused uh, this deficit thinking, she refused this, uh, the, the, the limits on her, the possibilities uh, that were in front of her. And she went on to be a trailblazer in every aspect of her life. The second person who inspires this is the African-American scholar, legal uh, literary scholar, um, Maya Angelou. And Maya Angelou said that courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, we can't practice any other virtue consistently. I think this is actually very important that we need in order to speak truth to power, in order to uh, um, confront difficult and contentious issues, in order to name some of the challenges we face, to confront systemic change, we actually have to have courage. Otherwise, we will end up with complicity we are more likely to engage in conformity. And the purpose of this speaker series is to ensure we actually effect change by drawing on the courageous people who speak truth to power, but who move from only speaking to action, who move from policy to implementation, who move from um, individual or autobiographical to actually think through systemic change. So this speaker series is, 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 is aimed at inspiring and igniting that kind of conversation and also that kind of transformative change. So today's discussion uh, delves more deeply into this language of decolonization. We want to engage the shifting vocabularies and, and perspectives and practices. We want to think about the meaning of the prefixes, for example, what, this, what is signified by the post, the neo-colonial or the decolonial. And we want to know what the implications of these terminologies are beyond, as uh, you've talked, talk, and, and Yang put it, decolonization is not a metaphor. So this session aims to have that difficult conversation, but also hope what we hope to be a clarifying conversation about the, the language of decolonization and the implications. We also want to have a conversation about what it means to have all these multiple decolonial terms and what they mean, most importantly, for the struggle for freedom, for liberation. And so, and freedom and liberation outside um, the Euro North American context, outside the English speaking context, what does this language mean and what are the implications? And what does it, what do we want to think about and say about decoloniality and its discontent? And how ought we to think about questions of interculturality with a focus on thinking, feeling, doing as it pertains to indigenous futures? This conversation is about all these kinds of questions. And in particular, we are interested in the questions related to the production of knowledge in our universities, colleges, CJEPs. What does it mean to think about decolonizing our curriculum? What does it mean to think about decolonizing our citational practices? What does it need, mean to think about decolonizing the production of knowledge in the contemporary academy? And whether, and whether we, how can we shift, for example, from a university to thinking about a pluri-university in the colonial context. What does it require of us? And what does it require in order to think about freedom, think about different futures, indigenous futures, decolonial futures? I couldn't think of two 
better speakers to have with us today than our speakers, um, um, Dr. Isabel Altamirano and Dr. Nogoru Gacheni. So before we launch into our discussions, let me introduce our two eminent speakers who are internationally renowned for their contributions to these conversations. Our first speaker is Dr. Sabello J. Nogulu Kacheni, who is a professor and chair of epistemology of the Global South with a emphasis on Africa at the University of Beirut in Germany. An impressive uh, uh, curricula, uh, uh, a CV. He previously worked at research, as a research professor and director of scholarship at the University of South Africa. He has also been a visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg and the Johannesburg Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, he is a leading decolonial theorist with over hundreds of publications and, 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 and numerous books, uh, important and timely books which uh, you will see in the um, chat for you, but also on the website. Thank you so much for being with us today. I will now turn the floor over to our first speaker, um, Dr. Noguru Gacheni. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda, for the for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I'm not actually at home. I'm actually in a conference here. So I'm speaking from a, a very, a very, a, a hotel. I'm not sure about the power of the, <clears throat> of the internet, but I think it, it will work well. And the greetings to Isabel. Um, I think maybe the, the starting point for our engagements on decolonization and the rethinking the coloniality of power, knowledge, and being is really to try and uh, uh, think about our current conjecture, particularly in the domain of knowledge. <clears throat> and the uh, I'm not sure whether it is me only or who are all aware of this, uh, or we feel what I'm feeling, which is that we're living at a moment when there is actually turmoil and the contestation in the world of knowledge. And uh, this turmoil and the contestation in the world of knowledge has implications for our lives as human beings and for our survival. And the, this which I see uh, a professor in a university is a moment of epistemological turbulence uh, characterized by what Wallerstein might have called uncertainties of knowledges. <clears throat> And the, these uncertainties of knowledge must not be taken in a negative sense. I take it in a very positive sense, in the sense that certitudes, particularly certitudes which were emerging from a colonizer's model of the world, certitudes which were blocking creativity, have actually exposed themselves. Hence, we have this moment of uncertainties of knowledge. But with the excitement, there is also the reality that we seem to be wandering through the forest, seeking a way forward. Hence, courageous conversations like these ones, perhaps they can help us to find the way forward. And I'm speaking here about maybe a planetary 
profound dissatisfaction with the existing knowledge and the current ways of knowing and the present ways of generating knowledge. And they indeed, even the most difficult question, which I find to be, we can't, we can't actually proceed without putting it across. Uh, perhaps words are failing me, but what I, I, I'm trying to talk about is what I will call the fact that knowledge of knowledge itself is being challenged and our knowledge of things is being questioned. I think that's, that's the, how far I can go in trying to describe what, what is upon us. And the, these uncertainties of knowledges then opens up that all of us, those who are said to be educated, I think is a moment in which we need to humble ourselves and subject ourselves to a painstaking process of learning to unlearn some of the things which actually come uh, with the colonialism, with imperialism, with capitalism, with the patriarchy. Uh, we will need to really unlearn so as to learn another way of knowing. And the, this crisis which I'm talking about, perhaps we will call it the epistemic crisis, uh, where meta scientific beliefs are really subjected to not not to, not to rethinking, but to, to unthinking itself. So I find that it will be important for us to preface, for me to preface this conversation with these words, and the highlighting at the end of the day that we are living at a time when basic epistemological questions have been reopened. And the, which are those basic epistemological questions which have been reopened? The most uh, talked about today, a basic epistemological question which has been opened is this one. The relationship between identity knowledge, <clears throat> there is a, even conservative movement, which is actually against this issue of speaking about the relationship between identity and knowledge, to the extent that you will see a pushback against critical race theory, post-colonial thought, intersectional theory, decolonial thinking within conservative cycles across many countries in Europe. But the question cannot be legislated out of existence. It is already in the middle of us. And what we need is to really think about it deeply, that any connection between knowledge and the identity, and my argument is there is a connection between knowledge and identity. We think as ourselves. We don't suspend ourselves when we think, when we produce knowledge. We don't put our identities in a, somewhere else when we write books, when we teach, we bring all those with ourselves. So there is need really to, to think about this relationship between knowledge and, 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 and the identity. And they, to try to run away from it, to try to ban those who are trying to think creative about it, I don't think it will take us anywhere. Then the second basic epistemological question, which is also open, is the question of, does knowledge have a geography? And I think that is another important question which we need to think about, or as some continue to convince us that you can produce knowledge in an unsituated way. I think this question has come, this basic question has come back to haunt us, that there they can be something called the geography of knowledge or geopolitics of knowledge. And then, of course, that that is related to also the question of the biography of knowledge, which I've already spoken about in terms of uh, identity and the body politics of knowledge. And I think these are important 
issues which actually we need to take into account when we think about, uh, when we try to rethink the whole issue of being power and the, and the knowledge in the sense that the question of ideology, I, 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 I teach in a university where there is always this debate about some people are producing scientific knowledge, others are producing ideological knowledge. That when you speak about yourself and you put yourself into the center of the, 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 <clears throat> the knowledge generation, then it is said that no, you are subjective, you are ideological, you are not scientific. And, the, and the, when you speak about indigenous knowledge system, endogenous knowledge systems, no, when you speak like that, you are putting yourself at the center and therefore you are bringing identity to knowledge and therefore you are actually violating scientific rules of knowledge generation. And I think, I think we, we need to, 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 to take a position on these issues, uh, whether it's possible really to, to produce knowledge and agendaless knowledge, if I can speak like that. A knowledge whereby you are neutral, you, do, you have no cognitive interest in it, you are disinterested. Uh, so what would be the purpose of that knowledge as far as I'm concerned? Because knowledge needs to be linked with the existential question, needs to be linked also <clears throat> with the, is linked also with issues of power. So that this, this were my opening, uh, the preface, to what I, I wanted to talk about. But the second aspect which I want to reflect on is that we were not going to be meeting like this today if it was not for the existence of a resilient cognitive empire, which continues to enable coloniality of knowledge. I think I, think I need to, 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 to put that across like that. Uh, and this cognitive empire, is the one which actually is responsible for most of the problems of, uh, of the modern world. It is this cognitive empire which enabled some people to think that the world belongs to them and they make all others foreigners here on earth. And, they, and they, it is this, this type of cognitive empire which made some people to think that There is their world and any of the or the empty empty lands. This is the empire. What remains very vicious is actually the cognitive empire, which invades the mental universe of a people and they make them think even against themselves. And it is important that. It was important for the purposes of the cognitive empire to make people rebel against themselves, against their knowledges, against their histories, against their cultures. And it has come now back into the center of, of knowledge that people are refusing to run away from their cultures, refusing to run away from their names, refusing to run away from their, from their, <clears throat> their knowledge. And they are proclaiming openly and they, Differently, that all sets of coloniality of being, coloniality of, uh, of knowledge and the coloniality of power, uh, they, are, they are actually related. And the most important part of it, starting with the, the clarification of this concept is that it will make clear so many of the things which we are going to discuss today. Uh, with the coloniality of being, how, 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 how is our being human colonized? In itself, I think I think it's a sounds like a philosophical question, but it is a very practical question. How how is our being human colonized? And we are talking here about the social classification of human population. We are talking about the racial classification of human population. We are talking about the gendering of the human population, and in the in the in the last instance, resulting 
in the invention of what I will call a, an invisible social pyramid, uh, which is standing at the center of the modern world. And in this invisible social pyramid, we hire the top layers of that social pyramid. And those with the skins like mine and the others, they occupy the lower part of that pyramid. And the others are even more unlucky that they are even kicked out of the pyramid altogether. And the reason being that those who are kicked out of the pyramid altogether, they are the ones who are subjected to genocide. Others, if you are subject, if you are pushed to subhumanity, you might actually be subjected to exploitation, to enslavement, and others. It is a pyramid which is supposed to enable who to kill, who to enslave, who to colonize. And I think that is very important for us to. To, 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 to put it that way. And it has a linkage with the coloniality of being in the sense that if we, they are saying that you are not a human being, fundamentally they are saying also you have no history, you have no knowledge, you have no culture, you have no, no language. So it's linkage. Um, and if, if you, are, you are pushed to the subhuman status, therefore whatever you, 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 you think, whatever you, you, you have as history, they will tell you that ah, this is superstition. This is non-scientific. It is not something they delegitimate everything. So you end up with the your your humanity is questioned, and therefore you you end up losing what we call epistemic virtue. So that's that's the situation. Which and then once we have created this social pyramid, which is a, which is which which at the center is this idea of the invention. Of, of differential ontological densities that some people have lower, others have higher, others have, others have no ontology at, 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 at all. <clears throat> Once we have done it that way, then you need to govern what we have, we have created. And the, the way you govern it, that's when the coloniality of, 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 of power comes in. That's when you then bring in the coloniality of power. You need to govern what we have created. And the way you govern it is by subjecting all aspects of human life to a modern colonial power structure. If it is gender, you subject it that way. If it's concept of beauty, you subject to that power. If it is a languages, you hierarchize colonial languages, you give them a higher level indigenous languages, you displace. So that's, that's where the coloniality of power comes in. But this cannot be a complete story if we don't therefore trace that from there, what images is that then you have a global economy of knowledge today. Some people, they are, they are, they are seduced by this global economy of knowledge to think that it, it fundamentally means a totality of all knowledge is from all parts of the world. That is not true what they call global economy of knowledge, it is still underpinned by what I will call the uneven intellectual division of labor. And I'm talking here from experience as somebody who developed his academic career from, from the continent, from, from Africa, whereby up to today, there is a lot of pressure to publish in, in international peer reviewed journals and those, international peer reviewed journals, they are either in North America or they are in Europe. And the idea of international itself is an international in the sense that you can't say, if I'm in South Africa and I publish in Argentina, then I've published in an international journal. It doesn't work that way. The international is very specific, is North America and, and, and Europe. And it is that which validates, which actually gives you recognition. And that is happening today. I'm not talking about something which happened during the colonial era. It is happening today in the universities, and they were complicit sometimes in 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 this in this type of in this type of work. So that fundamentally, the 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 point I'm trying to deliver is that we are still living under an epistemically colonized world. And then the third uh, reflections which I want to share. In regards to the, if the situation is like this, what have we done? How have we reacted to it? 
what struggles have we have we embarked on and what grammars of liberation have we tried to to use to 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 <coughs> To confront this 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 set reality, and uh, I want to say that the what 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 makes it as hard what makes it hard for us to actually come up with a with a, with a, a, a grammar which is accepted by all, you will find that the the visions of liberation, which we're working with for the past in the 20th century and even in the 21st century visions of African nationalism, visions of Marxism, visions of neoliberalism, all of them, they have actually reached their limits. If not, that they have collapsed. And it is within this context that then the concept of decolonization then re-emerges. It re-emerges uh, and is embraced by indigenous people's movement, is embraced by women and feminist movement, is embraced by ecological people involved in ecological struggles by students by academics but the issue is that because it is a language which emerges not in an academy but it emerges from the battlefields of history and i think we need to get that clear it is not a language which of liberation which emerges from from somebody sitting in a lab or sitting in a in a in a hotel the, the language of decolonization emerges from the battlefields of history. And the, it is a language which emerges from the struggles against enslavement, struggles against uh, colonialism, racism, patriarchy, sexism. As such, I think it would be not to understand the things, to think that it can be perfect. And uh, there will be one singular understanding of it. I, I don't think it, it will work that way. It will be important for us to understand that that if you go to Amilcar Cabral and he, you you see him as a decolonial thinker, he was not thinking from a classroom. He was thinking from the battlefield. If you go to a uh, Franz Fanon, you will find that he was not thinking from a classroom. He was thinking from the battlefield. If you go to Kwame Nkrumah, of course he was a head of state. He was involved in the struggles bigger struggles of Pan-Africanism and others. So those people were not thinking like myself and the others who are thinking from the universities. And as such, we're talking about knowledges which actually are, are also embracing tears and the blood, if, if I can use that word. And the, such knowledges, they will never be, be perfect. And, they, and they, their imperfection is their power. If, if, I can, if I can use it, the, the language like that. So you will find that it depends where you are located and the, which struggle you are confronting at a particular moment that you then develop a different language. You will find that people in the Caribbean, people in Latin America, people in Asia, people in Africa, they've come up with various um, grammars of actually confronting what we call cognitive empire, imperialism, capitalism, sexism, and patriarchy. Hey, so one of the one, one, one of the grammars, of course, is, is deracialization. That we needed to deracialize because there is in the in the in the words of uh, 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 <clears throat> William E. B. Du Bois, a color line. So so the deracialization became part and parcel of the grammar. In the, but the major problem about the racialization is that sometimes it was taken to mean changing demographics. You change the demographics without changing the structures and the systems and the institutions of uh, And then on the continent in the 1960s, the grammar was Africanization. And the Africanization became a, pre, a major preoccupation in the 1960s and it entailed enabling as a sign of being sovereign, enabling Africans to assume positions of authority, which were, which were occupied by the colonialists. Uh, <clears throat> but again, the limit of Africanization was that most of the time, it never also engaged in structural, systemic, and institutional changes. So you end up finding people with bodies like myself and a color like myself 
occupying position, sitting in positions of authority, but within a power structure which remains colonial, patriarchal. <clears throat> and it is within that, but we cannot minimize why people were thinking that Africanization is important. The, at the center of Africanization, there was actually a deeper thinking about it. And the deeper thinking about it was captured by Edward Wilmont Blyden in terms of creation of African personality, recre recreating African personality. A concept which, which was carried over by Kwame Nkrumah in Consciousness and by uh, Ali Mazuri in Triple Heritage, the attempt to reconstitute yourself uh, from what exists, in other words, from uh, the different heritages which we have. And then, of course, the other concept is indigenization. Uh, in, the, in the African context, indigenization, yes, I can, I can see that maybe I need to move faster now <laughs> because uh, I think my time is, 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 is gone. Uh, indigenization on the African continent was used more in relation to economy indigenization of economy. Uh, uh, it was used more in terms of nationalization of the economy and the recovery of what became known as indigenous knowledges. Then we have other grammars. I think uh, Isabel will pick, will pick some of them. Social inclusion, diversification, abolition, and reparations, which I cannot talk about here. But what I want to end by talking about is the issue of, uh, of the tens. I think because I have no time now, I will move very fast. You will find that you have a long decolonial movement. But this long decolonial movement, at its center, there are twists and the changes, which, for lack of a better term, we call them uh, tens. You will find that there is a nationalist term uh, where people thought that African nationalism will answer some of the questions of colonialism adequately, and that did not work. And they tended then to move to the Marxist term, where they then brought Marxism as an ideology. And it, again, in the attempt to actually, then you, you move on to, to maybe post-colonial uh, term, uh, the gender term. Uh, in, in, in all this, the attempt was really to still uh, articulate better this issue of decolonization. And, the, and the, the conclusion which I want to make, therefore, is that uh, uh, I think what, 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 the, what, 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 what Melinda started with about the issue of courage, I think is an important aspect in the sense that it is this courage which makes us to go back to a foundational question of saying, even if the colonialists denied that we are human beings, even if the colonialists denied that we have history, knowledge, and we don't take orders from colonialists, we need to redeclare that as human beings, we have knowledge, we have history, we have culture. And the, that is the precondition pre for the reopening of the basic epistemological questions. Uh, the epistemological questions, and they, they are opening up in such a way that there is then a refusal of knowledges of alienation and the knowledges of dehumanization. And uh, the people are beginning to say, we need to take ourselves seriously. These people who claimed through the colonizers model of the world that the earth belongs to them, who are now challenging them, the earth belongs to us as well. So that is where. I will need to end. I will pick some other issues when we, we have our discussions because of time. Thank you. Thank you so very, very much uh, for those uh, comments and I'm sure they will spark much conversation. Uh, right now, I'd like to uh, turn the, um, uh, introduce our uh, second uh, panelists who, uh, conversationalists who I've known for some time, Dr. Isabel Altamirano Jimenez, who is um, Inesak uh, 
from, from Oaxaca, Mexico. Originally, she is a professor of political science from the University of Alberta, uh, in, uh, internationally renowned. She has been appointed Canada Research Chair in Comparative Indigenous Feminist Studies has, and has led extensive research on place, gender, environment, relationship to body, land, and resource extraction. Um, numerous books uh, that are also on the website and will be re released in the chat as well. Dr. Altamirano Jimenez's work examines the link between indigeneity, gender, and the capitalist expansion in Anglo North America and Latin America. Uh, it theorizes uh, indigenous, comparative indigenous feminisms transnationally. She's written numerous books and co-edited numerous books, articles, and chapters. Um, please join me in welcoming to our virtual stage, um, Dr. Isabel Altamirano Jimenez. Thank you, Melinda, for that introduction. I am located in Treaty 6 territory. I'm speaking for Treaty 6 territory. I'm Miskwasis Huescajican, or also known as Edmonton. I want to thank you, Melinda, for organizing these important conversations and for inviting me to join today. And thank you, uh, every, the audience, for, for listening. I want to approach this conversation from an indigenous, specifically a Zapotec perspective, and from a question that has, I, I have been thinking for a little while now. What does it mean to include the experiences, concepts, and ex epistemes of bodies that have and continue to be dispossessed without centering land itself? If, as decolonial scholars suggest, decoloniality is a process of undoing the mother structures of global coloniality that shapes culture, beings, knowledge production, and power, how do we do that without bringing to surface the experiences of invisible communities of bodies that, that continue to resist colonial extractions and land dispossession beyond a specific historical moment. I think that as an indigenous scholar, I always am interested in how the coloniality has made the structures of colonial inequities visible, showing how Western knowledge and imperialism operate at the epistemological level, producing the structures that continue to be reproduced through colonial projects and strategies such as racialization, authority, and power that Savello has put in, in, in a really, really good, uh, clear way. Colonial, the colonial scholars based, particularly, I'm thinking the ones based on the United States, have reframed with modernity and coloniality by placing the horizon of modernity back to the late 15th century. They have focused on the imperial activities of European countries in the conquest of the Americas and on the making of capital of the making of the capitalist world system. Unlike colonialism, which they have thought of as a historical phenomenon, coloniality is an outcome, is the context in which we all continue to reside despite the colonization movements. Coloniality and Western domination have silenced indigenous knowledges and local, and local knowledges and experiences and instituted this teleological re reading of human history that assumes that Western civilization is the pinnacle of progress. Inherent in this view is the notion that Western culture is one and is universal while other cultures are localized and particular. Therefore, West, white Western, Western culture has come sort of like a, a global norm, as Sabella was mentioning, that defines how beauty is, 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 is understood, that defines how, how history is understood and what constitutes knowledge. Against, against that norm, other cultures are judged and often, often found lacking. 
Decoloniality has emerged as a political project that challenges the epistemological foundations of colonialism and the links from Eurocentric thought by reclaiming known Western ontologies and imagining that other worlds are possible to use Subcomandante Marcos from the Zapatista movement words as a political process of creating knowledge and new radical subjectivities, the coloniality is a conscious choice to change to challenge the constitution of Western knowledge, what counts as such, and the boundaries of where to look for philosophical ideas. The coloniality performs an epistemic movement that doesn't start from Latour, Foucault, or Lacan, modifying their theories to make them amenable to reality but rather want to start from the genealogy of other knowledges, from who produces such knowledges, from where and why. The coloniality is less, a little bit less concerned with the historical and neocolonial strategies of domination at this particular moment, and more with the longstanding ontological, epistemological, and axiological legacies that were left intact after the colonial processes have ended. The global coloniality of power, of being and perception of gender and knowledge is a manifestation of context and conditions that remains and that determines the relations between the world, the things and the humans. While the coloniality, the coloniality might appear to point to similar efforts of, to decolonization, from ongoing legacies of colonialism, these terms are not interchangeable and don't resonate in the same ways in different places. Decolonization is a concept that in my mind encourages to recognize the continuous struggles for liberation, self-determination and sovereignty even way after World War II ended. It invites us to acknowledge the colonial present of indigenous peoples and other racialized peoples around the world. While I, like, I acknowledge that the term decolonization has been used and abused to define diets, new core syllabi, institutions, and so forth, and that in, in a university context, we use the term decolonization in, in rather um, 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 problem, um, in problematic ways, in rather problematic ways. But here I want to think about the term in relation to land. I want to think of the coloniality of power as a structure that has mapped itself on top of the ongoing colonial realities of indigenous peoples, creating different dynamics that continue to affect our experiences as we move and are made move from our lands and relations. I cannot acknowledge coloniality without considering internal colonialism and the impact that land dispossession continues to have on indigenous communities in both the global north and the global south. Internal colonialism provides a historical schema and an analytical tool that rejects the treatment of colonialism as a relic of the past and instead highlights the active deployment of colonial strategies and processes across space and time. Mexican sociology, Pablo Gonzalez Casanova, noted that internal colonialism refers to the status of domination of indigenous peoples in their own homelands within the boundaries of a modern state dominated by other people. Although Mexico, and I would say but many other uh, Latin American countries, gain independence after hundreds of years of the Spanish colonial rule, Gonzalez Casanova points out that indigenous peoples in the newly independent state remain in the same, if not worse, colonial relation of domination. This unaltered condition is not just ontological, epistemological, or axiological. What I found useful about the concept of internal colonialism is that it helps me visualize the different ways in which different bodies have been unevenly affected by the coloniality of power. While global coloniality 
is supposedly affecting not only the colonized, the subaltern, the people in the global north, including the people in the global, in the global north, we are differently situated. Colonialism and coloniality, the coloniality and the colonization have been used interchangeably in many contexts when they should rather become sources of much needed dialogues, dialogues and exchanges. In my view, there is some, somewhat a problematic situation when ongoing colonialism is not centered and when counter hegemonic discourses might only privilege overarching cognitive processes to the detriment of indigenous peoples, black and other colonized peoples histories and experiences. When I think of the Americas and even the Pacific, for example, I think that ongoing indigenous dispossession needs to be central to any post-colonial accounts. Land, water, and the body have played and continue to play a significant role in the construction of the material world and how, in, and how, it, how it has been experienced. Just as the construction of the so-called new world mark, was marked by the ca captive, the dispossessed and the exploited body, the body, land, and water are central to how we imagine other the liberated such, subject. The land we stand upon and the decolonial desires anchors, anchors attention in contemporary geographies of liberation. Talk and Yang suggest that while exchanging ideas is important, real change involves centuries of centering stolen lands into any meaningful discussion of decolonization. I would further argue that decolonization also needs to be understood as an embodied movement, not just a purely cognitive or semantic one. Any decolonial approach most center colonization past and present directly and openly and acknowledge the place specific, the place specific nature of indigeneity and the different processes that have shaped our identity and our current locations. Decolonization on the other hand, requires breaking away from the internalized spells that have prevented our humanity as well as relationship buildings with black and other racialized communities. Other, otherwise we run the risk of being anti-black or anti-other communities. Relationships need to be reciprocal and responsible in order to co-create other worlds. Embedded in indigenous ancestral knowledge, senti pensar, which is translated often as feeling thinking, but I prefer to translate this term as thinking from the heart. To me, it involves a way of being in the world, of knowing the world that is not only theoretical, but practice. It involves the kinetics of our body, the ethos of responsibility that comes from our hearts. Or as Zapotec thinker Jaime Martinez Luna's notes involves obligation. In Spanish, obligo means belly button and oblig obligación means obligation. By connecting these two words, obligation refers to a course of responsible action that comes from being interconnected with each other and the non-human world. From this perspective, enacting other worlds not only requires epistemic liberation, but also acting, making relatives. Epistemic liberation is not only about taking seriously the perspectives, cosmologies, and insights from the racial, ethnic, indigenous, and gender bodies of the global South, but also about acting to show the necessary relationality to defend indigenous land as a source of other knowledge. What knowledge may render imaginable cannot be achieved without the kinetics of self-determining bodies, without the obligation to enact other worlds, without the grounded practice that can make pathways into relational geographies with the human and non-human world. At the center of obligation is a communal ethos of relationality between humans and also between humans and other than human kin. As Melanie Yassi argues, 
This relationality expands human-centric relations to include water, land, wind, animals within our circles. Importantly, this expansion shifts colonial heteropatriarchal criteria of belonging within larger coalitions of interspecies relations. These coalitions, solidarity, and intercommunalism are key elements of processes of mutual liberation. If we are to realize other decolonial dreams, engaging the knowledge systems of the colonized without obligation, without making relatives, might also run the risk of reproducing appropriation, particularly in academic settings. How we engage knowledge, experience, concepts from other people can produce vastly different political outcomes. And I'm particularly concerned about how these terms circulate in academia, and I'm particularly concerned about not reproducing the same kind of um, Eurocentric hierarchies when we are asked to cite certain certain uh, certain scholars, but not others, when we are asked to, to talk about um, or to write in specific ways, but not others. Obligation then is a commitment to solidarity and a critical intervention into current thinking about indigenous education and other constellations of struggles and knowledge co-production projects. It is about how knowledge is generated ground up and within a network of relationships. It has been noted that indigenous ed education and knowledge comes from the land. Simpson, Dan Simpson, for example, has argued that land is a process and a context. Knowledge flows between living things. Knowledge requires consens consensual engagement. Decolonization doesn't come from theorizing or just writing. New decolonizing knowledge can only be created by doing the actual work of building the work we want. In Oaxaca and the Tehuantepec Isthmus, where I come from, this work has taken the form of communal knowledge co-production. The University of Communality, a project I am involved with, is building a new path to advance communal, mutual communal learning and knowledge production that honors the communal practices, languages, values, and governance structures of indigenous communities. We don't seek just to revitalize and research indigenous knowledge, but also enact higher education as a communal responsibility, as an education that is practiced and theorized as a service that responds to the, the community's local concerns and that seeks to reestablish the context of indigenous knowledge. Without valuing and recognizing the context in which indigenous or local knowledge is generated, the practice of freedom, sovereignty, and self-determination over our lands and our bodies and our futures cannot fully realize. And I'm particularly concerned, again, over how in university context we have been talking about these terms without necessarily engaging in the actual work of doing decolonization, of decolonizing academia, of decolonizing our knowledge. Particularly, as, as uh, Sabella was mentioning, particularly in this context, when the university is moving towards uh, the commercialization of knowledge, towards the, the the in, even sort of like the going again back to the how objective knowledge is considered the one that can actually can be sellable that can be valued not by the knowledge that is being generated but by its ability to make profits and in this particular context it's worth that our we ask ourselves what do, does these terms mean to us when we speak of decolonization, when we speak of decoloniality, what is that we're speaking about? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Thank you very much, Sabello.
uh, I really appreciate the rich um, interventions you have made. Uh, I know um, Elder Sitting Eagle is back on the screen. So before I ask my question, I want to check in to see if she has a question. And if not, I would like to ask one or two questions and then turn it over to the audience. Elder Sitting Eagle. So, so maybe I'll ask my first question, and then we can come back to it. I, I want to ask, I want to thank you both uh, for just an extraordinary um, discussion around these, this question of decolonization, which you complicate in ways that I think um, are necessary, especially, uh, and I'm thinking here, Isabel, too, of your, your, your closing about the ways in which we think about this as theorizing. And then uh, Isabella's comment about uh, decolonia, decolonization, what do you think about Cesar or Kwame Nkrumah? This was from the battlefields, not the classrooms, not the lab, lab, uh, labs. So in a way, there's this, this, this understanding that how we think about knowledge production actually um, has gotten away from this. And certainly, if we can think of knowledge production in the university, uh, but, how, it, but it's probably not decolonial if it's not connected to, to land um, and place and territories. But I want to, I also uh, appreciate the comments each of you are making about what, uh, uh, as well, you call the identity knowledge kind of uh, nexus. Um, and how that's connected to this, this the, the, the reality that if you question, if you demean, if you degrade the humanity of a people, this has implications for uh, whether we understand the ability to produce knowledge. So if you think of a pe per people um, in, 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 in racist ways or in terms of their gender, you question their humanity based on their gender or gender identity or gender expression, you can't think epistemic freedom. <laughs> you, cannot, you, you cannot get to that point. So that there's, there's an inextricable connection between the degradation of a people and in the context of the appropriation of their lands. Or what I think at one point, as in another uh, place, you talk about the zone of being and non-being, and then the zone of non-being are those people without a knowledge, a civilization, a humanity. And, and, and not just people, it is, Isabel, you also highlight non-human kin. Um, so I wonder if you could just, each of you can talk a bit more about this inextricable connection to, to the, the, how we think about humanity or non-being and the connection to knowledge, particularly in the university and why universities in particular need to be attentive to how to, to, to the racism and the sexism and to, and to these kinds of questions, because they are also connected to how we think about knowledge production, how we think about the human, but also knowledge production. So, I mean, it's a, it's a law, it's a commentary, but it's also <laughs> in there. I, I think in this moment in particular of racial reckoning, of this conversation about decolonization, we need to think the connection between knowledge production. Um, do you want to start or should I? In fact, he, he, when, when, when Melinda was asking and making these inputs, my, whether my internet was jumping, there was a lot of, I didn't get much of what, but I think I picked some of the issues. Should I? Should I go? Um, I, I can start if you want. Um, I, I think that to me, it seems to me that um, it's not just the idea that it starts with the, the, that when we're talking about knowledge and the connection between identity and knowledge, from an indigenous perspective, I'm thinking that the question doesn't start with who is a human and who is not, but the, rather the question starts with what is life and what is not life. 
from an indigenous perspective, what in Western knowledge might be perceived as not as non-life is a living thing, is a living entity. And that's what land is, that's what water is, that's what wind is. So these categorizations actually didn't start with, with us just humans. We started with more than that, with actually starting with the conversation of what constitutes life and what doesn't. And from there, all of the, the hierarchies have fallen, have, have fallen through. What is, you know, like the hierarchies between uh, humans, human beings, and quasi-humans, or the hierarchies between who is capable of producing knowledge and, and not producing knowledge. And what is, to me, what is um, complicated when we think about knowledge production without considering this idea of life and non-life is that we are forgetting where does knowledge starts or how is knowledge co-produced? Because we are operating in, in academia that works in a particular way, that works at these institutions that are recognized as being the centers where knowledge is produced, as opposed to understanding that knowledge is produced elsewhere in many other different places. So efforts to talk about decolonization or indigenizing academia are from the beginning completely decontextualized because we are picking and choosing what we are bringing into these institutions as opposed to understanding the context and the process of knowledge production. And I think that that's, that's what, um, what I find extremely complicated when we think about how do we decolonize academia or how do we decolonize or indigenize academia? That we need to have these conversations about how do we open up academia or universities as centers of knowledge production in ways that this knowledge is not just concentrated in these spaces, is not just contained in those spaces, but actually so that knowledge flows from different contexts and in different ways. Okay, Sabella, did you, did you want me to elaborate, or, did, or, or, or you, or you, you can you can follow? You got in, you caught enough. Yeah, let me pick a few a few a few issues. First, from uh, from uh, uh, Isabella's uh, interventions, is what I found very profound is <clears throat> first of all, I spoke about identity and knowledge. And we have brought in the issue of land as another important aspect in that. <clears throat> and, the, and the thirdly, you have redefined that the way the, we define knowledge today is not the way uh, indigenous people defined knowledge. Uh, knowledge uh, for the indigenous people to as a matter of what is life and what is not life. The will to live was a very central issue than the will to power maybe. If I, if I can put it that way. Uh, but what I also find very interesting is what you said about uh, the issue of uh, relationality. Uh, I found that to be very important when you, you spoke about interspecies relations and the issue of, of uh, first of all, we need to create to be relatives in 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 a, in a way, I think colonialism's first major crime was to destroy being relatives exactly. as human beings, our inter our, our interconnections. So, with the paradigm of difference as a central lit motif of, of of colonialism and coloniality, they destroyed this relationality between things. 
And uh, this issue of hierarchy, uh, uh, this issue of some things are superior, some are not superior, they actually destroyed that, 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 that aspect. And uh, I thought that was very, very, very important. And then this takes us maybe to, to, to Melinda's questions about, you see, the problematic of thinking from a university. Uh, I'm, I'm actually very aware of the problematic which I carry myself as somebody who thinks from a university. Because the university, when I grew up, I thought it was a space where you learn, you generate knowledge and all that. But I'm realizing the university is very compl is complicit in most of the things which we're talking about. Uh, I think recent research has proven that university has been complicit. Most of them, the endowments from enslavement. Uh, most of them were complicit in colonialism. Today, they are still complicit in patriarchy. This is why they are dominated by men and, and, and all that. And then they become also complicit with capitalism. Hence the quickness of the corporatization, uh, the commercialization of knowledge and all that. And this raises a major issue that when we want to think about decolonization from a university, the first thing is to think about changing the institutional decolonization of the university. It looks like we like the university, but we don't like it the way it is. It needs to be redefined. Uh, and what does it mean to redefine the university itself uh, in such a way that the university is not a home for what today is called disciplinary knowledge. And I think that knowledge is not about life and what is not life. That is, that is a knowledge about something else. But it was still colonized by that disciplinary knowledge. And the disciplinary knowledge, I think, save it. it has its own purposes than the will to life. <clears throat> I thought this would be this would be this would be important because. When I spoke about indigen indigenization, uh, uh, I spoke about nationalization of economy and I didn't speak about land. I'm so happy that you brought the issue of land because I come from the Southern African region, which actually experienced secular colonialism. Zimbabwe, South Africa, Mozambique, uh, Namibia. The struggles are still about land. And the question is, the linkage between life, land, and knowledge. I think that that linkage needs to be made more powerfully. And thank you so much for that. Thank you very much. Uh, did you want to respond before I ask another question, Isabel? Um, um, I, I just I think it's you know going back to this triad of um, land, knowledge, and life. Um, you know, as, as central to, to thinking, not just about, and I keep insisting that it's not just about knowledge production, but knowledge co-production. And we need to, to speak about knowledge co-production when, whenever we do this. And, but I also connected with this to rethink, we also, I, I believe that it's also important to rethink about knowledge from a consensual point of view. If we say that this triad is important, knowledge, life, and land is important, it's also that cons cons having a consensual relationship in the co-production of knowledge is important. And the universities, the university context, because of the way it has established itself, is not necessarily consensual. And I, I'm thinking here of two things. One, what uh, Elder Sidney Eagle said at the beginning, when she was talking about the experiences in residential school, that was obvi obviously non-consensual, right? That, that learning stopped being consensual, that knowledge stopped being consensual. But I'm also thinking about what Leanne Simpson in, in, in her article, uh, Lana's Pedagogy, that when these curriculums 
are decided without necessarily incorporating or being mindful of, of whose knowledge we are incorporating. And without sort of going through a process of building this obligation or relationality that I was mentioning before, it also becomes non-consensual. And that that's, that's something that also needs to be reworked at the universities within university context. Thanks. Um, I, I, I have one question. It may be too big for the time we have left. And, and because you've each been talking about the implications of uh, what you're saying for disciplines. And, and I think someone mentioned uh, Raman Grosfugel, uh, work, I mean, the, the, the work of the decolonial school around a pluri-university, what that might entail. But I'm also thinking about the, fact, about the, the reference to citational practice, um, to the, 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 the argument that when we, in universities and in disciplines, we have these things called core and periphery. So you're always trying to bring an Africanization that to change the core or indigenization to change the core. Um, and, but the, the, the ethnos, the, the ethno-national, the provincial knowledges of Europe, of six, six actually, six uh, metropolitan centers in Europe actually is where the majority of social science knowledge emerges from, as well as the journals and the citations of practice and the ranking systems. How do we get to a pluri-university with this kind of political economy of knowledge production in which our universities, including by our um, desire for hierarchies, not, mut not mutuality, not co-production, but hierarchies. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, and maybe that's the, uh, the, the kind of global power structure too around knowledges. How do we actually begin to unsettle and transform this edifice that we have inherited, this colonial edifice that we continue to work in, but the implications for discipline and the socialization and the reproduction of knowledges from this moment so what, what's, what's necessary? And I know that's another two or three books, but <laughs> in the time we have. I'm gonna go ahead, Sabello. In fact, thinking about the university from uh, the African context, we have always tried to say, at the moment we have universities in Africa, we don't have African universities we are trying to establish them. And by this, we mean that a university can be located in a place, but is not of that place. In other words, the university does not take into account the cultures, the histories, the cosmologies, the knowledges of that place. So it is, it is, it is present among the people in their space, but generally it, parachutes knowledge from somewhere else. So the decolonization, which we're trying to, to think about is really to think about how do, we, how do we bring a university uh, which, is, which, which, which is anchored within, 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 within the African context. And bearing in mind that this won't be the first time bearing in mind that prior to colonization, there were universities in Africa. You can think of, uh, of, uh, of the university in Timbuktu. Mm -hmm. uh, you can think about the university in Morocco in Fez. You can think of the university in Cairo. So it is that spirit which says, but this, the university does not come from Europe. They, they were universities in, 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 in Africa. But these ones which exist now, are not an outgrowth of those ones which I'm talking about. These ones then, perhaps because of enslavement and the colonialism, there was a rupture sort of, uh, then those ones, they, there was no continuity. And, they, and the issue is how do we make sure that we have universities which actually services the people, universities which are for liberation, not for alienation. I think that's, 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 that's where the, I've, I've, I've been teaching for the past two decades or so. I found people coming to the university that I can't speak, say. And they say, but do you have a language? Why are you, why are you saying you can't speak? 
saying, no, but the language which you speak here, I don't know. And therefore, I can't speak. The people feeling that coming to the university, really, they needed to, to undergo, to die and uh, re-image so that they image it's uni proper university students. And uh, that type of, of alienation, that type of, 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 of acculturation, I think he is he still carries the, the gene of, of colonization. And unless we, we think deeply about changing the institutional uh, aspects of the university, one of the most difficult part. But finally, the issue is also that the university is inhabited by people like me and you. Hey, I'm, I'm, I was trained by a westernized university, if I can use that word, a, a westernized university. And the process which I'm undergoing is really against myself, not anybody else, because I needed to, to really to unlearn so many things which I thought were the right things for, for a very long time. <clears throat> I think, I was, sorry, uh, I, I just thought that what you said is really important. It's almost in, in the sense that we need to sort of unlearn ourselves. I think that that's sort of like a, really important in this process because we have been trained in these institutions and and I you know experience a similar situation that you that that you talk about that my training in the, at the beginning of my academic career was speaking the language of that training mm -hmm. and now I'm undoing that to be able to speak differently Mm -hmm. So it's in a way it is a process of unlearning what we have learned in order to change from, from the kind of work that we are doing. Mm -hmm. But also to me, it's also important to be also part of other projects where we are sort of practicing those other ways, ways of teaching and learning and knowing as, as sort of like as in these uh, projects of uh, such as the University of Communality that I was mentioning in Oaxaca. Is, so where mm -hmm. do you almost go through a process of um, the institutionalization in order to teach mm -hmm. differently? Or where you engage sort of like in some of the projects here in Canada about land-based education, where sort of is, is like a ways of knowing and learning that are not necessarily the ways in which we have been traditionally trained in these institutions. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I, I, I think that's actually an important uh, place to bring to a close this conversation in this moment. Although, as I said to you previously, when I we, we invited you that we hope to bring you all together in Calgary um, uh, to have this uh, a much more continuing conversation, including with with, with students, because I think that the, 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 the comments you've made, the, the interventions you've made are so important for how we think about the role of the university, not just in epistemic freedom, but also in the question of liberation and, 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 and whether we are actually working against ourselves in the very kind of uh, democracies and the very kinds of spaces that are necessary for our survival, if in fact, the way we go about knowledge production is actually antithetical to that. Um, but so I, I want to, I, want, so I, I think we need to continue talking about what does it mean to have land-based education as Isabel talked about, uh, what, what do we have co-constitution of knowledge? What do we have to mean to talk about the third university or the university of the commonality or other kinds of universities that say there are other ways, um, uh, other ways of being and knowing. <clears throat> But it also begs the question then about the who's um, the purposes the university serve, and who and what do they serve, and whether they, uh, they and and whether we have gotten away from something uh, much more fundamental, or whether in fact what we are engaged in is actually indicative of this colonial heritage that we have yet to shake. And, and we can talk about uh, the kind of system in which the political economy system in which that emerges. I mean, I think that I think we have raised more questions, but I think that's important. I, but I think the questions are important for us to thinking about what is to be done. 
in, in an ongoing and, and what other kinds of conversations we need to be having. So um, before I, um, so I really want to uh, thank both of you, uh, Sabello and Isabel, for this extraordinary uh, conversation that you've been engaged in and the interventions you have made, including with each other. And I also want to thank Elder Colleen Sitting Eagle uh, for her um, contributions to this conversation and the previous one. Um, there are lots more questions that people have, which means we need to have you back. And I keep insisting face to face, because even this, this moment of COVID times, too, will pass. Um, and I want to say, so I want to say a profound thank you from all of us at the University of Calgary. Thank you. Uh, if, uh, and, and to each of you. And I want to say our next uh, conversation to, the, to all of those who have been on, I think over 900 people signed up. I know many people sometimes sign up because they want to get the, the, the video afterwards. Um, but I, 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 I really want to thank you for joining us for this conversation. And I hope you will come back for our third conversation in the series, which will take place on November 18th. Um, from 12 noon to 1.30 with Dr. Vernon St. Denis, uh, um, who is at the University, uh, as he says, uh, it put Verna, who's at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, uh, in, and uh, Dr. Shirley Ann Tate, who is in the Department of Sociology at the University of Alberta, a Canada Research Chair in Intersectionality and Feminism, will be our next speaker. Um, and they'll be speaking on the topic of anti-racism and decolonization in the university. So we have talked about difficult, important transformational questions that are necessary. Thank you for your willingness to take part in these conversations and to, be, and, uh, and to have conversations with each other and to put your ideas and thoughts out there, but also to offer suggestions about what we need to do, including, and this is actually a profound thought to think about, in order to transform, we actually need to unlearn what we have spent decades learning in our uh, universities and our schools, in terms of our theories, our methodologies, our ways of, of knowing. And, and, and it begs the question whether universities, uh, we are using our time wisely and uh, uh, the spaces that we have uh, wisely. This, this conversation will help to fuel a momentum for change so I wanna thank you for your knowledge and your wisdom. I wanna thank you for your openness and your contributions. I wanna thank you for being with us today. For those of you who are online again, please go to our website at ucalgary.ca forward slash equity dash diversity dash inclusion. And you will find the last year's series on, the, on a courageous conversation as well as this one. And for more information on the speakers, we will also have on our website this video webinar, but also further readings from them because the conversation continues until they arrive here with us. Each speaker has also provided us with a full list of readings and resources. And as I said, they will be on our website as long as other kinds of resources we can provide because this has only been um, a short intervention into this conversation. Thank you all very much for joining us today. And I, we hope to see you next time. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Sabello. And thank you, audience, for joining us at the University of Calgary today. <laughs>